Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing well today. Uh, it's beautiful here at 767 Lee Road in Clyde, North Carolina. It's always beautiful online at newcovenantchurch.com. I hope you're enjoying yourself this morning. Uh, yes, Pastor Chip is in the room. I'm pre-warning you. There could be some amen shouts. There could be some preach I'm going to work for it because I, 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 I like humans more than I like these cameras. So I'm going I'm to preach to Pastor Chip a little bit in the room today, have some fun. I, I do want to take a moment and uh, acknowledge that tomorrow is Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a, a holiday for the United States of America for those who have fought and died uh, in protecting the, the freedom that we have as American citizens. Uh, usually what I would do is I would have people in the room who have served in our military to stand up so we could all clap and acknowledge them. And I thought about, you know, I can't do that this year. And I thought, why not? Why can't we do that? If, you're, if you served in the military or you're the spouse or children of people who served in the military, I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are and just be acknowledged. It's okay for you to have the honor that is due to you in, in your own living room. So just stand up right now. If you're Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, stand up and I give you a big shout out and say thank you for your contribution and your service uh, to, the, to the United States of America. Uh, Colonel Kurt Furtado is in the room and I'm, I'm, I'm giving him a big shout out right now. All right, Major or Colonel? Major, Major, Major Kurt Furtado in the room. Big shout out. Uh, appreciate you, sir, so much. Uh, take time to love on somebody in the military. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, there's a lot of um, uncertainty uh, when you're in the military. You, you, you wait till you get orders and you do what you're told. And so there's a lot of sacrifice. So make sure you give a big shout out to somebody that you love that's in the military. And uh, as, because of that, we're closed tomorrow. We're, we're not going to be meeting tomorrow, but we'll be back on Tuesday and hitting it full force. Uh, another thing I want to talk about before I get into my sermon today is uh, our governor came out on Wednesday and said that churches uh, were exempt from phase two. Uh, and then on Friday, our president came out and said that churches are essential and he encouraged churches to come back as quick as possible. And then on Friday, the CDC released some safety guidelines for social distancing and cleaning for churches and church services. And so on Tuesday, when we get back in here, uh, we've been talking every week about when to re-enter, how to re-enter, uh, what that's going to look like. And, um, but with those three events happening last week, we'll have a, a lot more in-depth conversations coming up this week. And, and there's really three questions we, we need to answer. We need to answer when are we going to be able to come back. Number two, how is that going to feel and look like when we come back? And the third thing, I don't want us to, to miss this. I don't want this to, to be a thing that we overlook. I, I, I appreciate what the president says. I appreciate what the governor says. I need to know what Jesus is saying. I, I want to know what, when Jesus says we're supposed to come back and how we're supposed to come back. And also, our smaller churches, in our, I'm on Zoom with at least 50 pastors every week. And, uh, and, and some of those are here locally in Haywood County, but many of them are around America. And, and one of the things that I'm paying attention to is our smaller churches are of such value right now. They're coming back already, and they're teaching the larger churches on what to expect, uh, how to navigate uh, different issues and problems. So uh, I want to give them a, a chance to come back before we come back. We want to keep everybody safe. And we also want to make sure when we come back, we come back under the full blessing of the Lord, with the grace and the goodness of God flowing upon our services. And so just be prayerful uh, with us about that. Be patient with us about that. We want to uh, come together as a congregation and worship the Lord and be together. We want to hug. We want to see each other. But, but that's probably going to be a process, not an event. It's probably going to take us a, little, a couple half steps to get there because we're a bigger church and we've grown while we've been in this pandemic. So just bear with us. We are definitely expect to be able to put something out this this week, uh, some kind of time frame and what that might look like. So just be watching for us to, to post that. But I did want to go ahead and respond to that since uh, the governor, the president, and the CDC all came out last week. It feels like they've opened those doors. Now we need to stay very close to Jesus, ask him how he wants us to come back and when he wants us to come back. And then we'll fill you in on those details as the staff and elders meet this week. We'll talk some more about that. All right, so now we're going to get into our word. We started a sermon series last week called Nourished, and we felt like it was, it was the right thing to talk about as we are coming through this pandemic 
And as it looks like we are beginning to reopen uh, the church uh, services and building, uh, you know, somebody had told me recently that the church was shut down, and I just totally reject that. The church is not shut down. The church is thriving right now. The gospel is being preached and shared around the world more than it ever has at any other time. People are being saved. People are being discipled. We're still taking care of the widow and the orphan and the poor, and we're still reaching out in our community. The church is thriving, and that's one of the reasons I don't want us to quickly rush back if the Lord's blessing is in a different way right now. So we've got to discern that. We've got, to, we've got over 20 staff and elders that meet weekly to process all that stuff. But we felt like that during this season, and by the way, one of the things that's, that's happening as I'm talking to these, all these other pastors is, is what is God saying about the next season? What, what's God saying like three months from now, six months from now? And all of them are saying the same thing. God's not speaking six months from now. He's speaking right now. He, it's like we're standing at the Jordan River waiting for him to say, go ahead and step on the Jordan. And, and everybody's in a real time. One of my pastor friends says, I've got next week's sermon written, and that's all I've got in the hopper. I don't have any other sermons written. This sermon is the last sermon I have written. It is real time with the Lord. And I think there's a, a faith element there. I think he wants us to get comfortable with a now word from God, with not knowing what's coming, but trusting his faithfulness to us. So that's what I'm hearing from other pastors is that, that, that there's a general sense of settling in his word for today and being ready to move by faith the moment that he speaks a command to us. And so that's what's going on. We started this sermon series last Sunday called Nourish because we felt like it was an important time for us to discuss how are we taking care of ourselves. And, and I, I want to say this up front. Uh, sometimes people who are new to New Covenant Church will say, why do y'all talk so much about inner healing? And you talk about stuff that's not specifically gospel-centered, like preach the gospel that Jesus came to take away our sins. Well, the gospel story of Jesus coming, dying on the cross to take away my sins, and resurrecting from the dead, and sitting next to the Father that I might have life, is, is, that's, a, that's a, a sermon that's preached in every church in America. But Sadly, in many churches, that's the only sermon that's preached. Sadly, that we have people who have been saved for 20 years but are still spiritual babies because all they've ever gotten is just that message. They've not learned how to bring the rest of life. Like Jesus doesn't just want to be uh, Lord over, he doesn't just want to be my Savior. He wants to be Lord over my life. And right. my life is made up of lots of things, my physical body, emotions, relationships, all kinds of stuff. And so we talk a lot about, and I like to poke on it this way, it doesn't matter how many scriptures you've memorized. It doesn't matter how much of the Lord you know. If somebody pokes you and the devil comes out, you're not very spiritual mature. Right. So, so I find that people, uh, Christians tend to overvalue their spiritual health and undervalue their emotional, mental, and relational health, but that's where we are actually are able to be Christ to other people. So we're in a sermon series called Nourish, so we can take care of ourselves. And last week, I talked about mental health, and I defined mental health as the ability to process information and experiences in a way that lowers our stress and keeps our focus so that we can make good decisions. So uh, our blurb for this sermon series, uh, we're using a quote by Parker Palmer that says, self-care is never a selfish act. It's simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give it the care it requires, we do it not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. And so I want to talk about emotional me today. I separated mental me being more of our thought process. And today I want to talk about emotional me. And how I'm going to define that is emotional health is being aware of your emotions and managing and expressing them in an age-appropriate manner. One of the ways you can tell how emotionally mature you are is how often do you express your emotions in a childlike way? I'm going to pause there for just a second, pause for effect. 
If periodically your emotions come up and come out in a childlike manner, you've got some healing you need to do and some maturing you need to do in your emotions. Every once in a while, I'll have an emotional moment that I'm sitting here I'm thinking, you sound like a little kid stomping your foot. And, and, and in that moment, I'm like, you sure are being immature. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And I recognize I still have some areas I need to grow in my own emotional health. So today, our sermon is called Emotional Me. I'm going to read a passage to you that rocked my world this week. I've read this passage before. I mean, I've read this passage. Like somebody stuck it in my Bible this week, and I had never been there before. But I'm going to go, I'm going to read this passage, and, and, and then I'm going to go off trail for a while, and then I'm going to come back to this passage and show you something that you didn't see when I read it the first time. Are you ready? So 3 John only has one chapter. 3 John, the first verse and second verse says this. The elder, okay, the elder, this is being written by John, one of the disciples of Jesus, John the Beloved. He's writing this as an elder, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Um, King James says, may you prosper as your soul prospers. Wow. That word soul is suke. It has to do with your mind, your will, and your emotions, not your spirit. It has to do with who you are as a person. And so it says, may you prosper. May you do well, even as your soul prospers. And so God wants to not only uh, uh, birth you spiritually as a living being, an eternal living son of God, he also wants to take your mind, your will, and your emotions, and he wants to father you in that, that you're healthy and that you're whole and that you thrive and prosper even as your soul prospers. Now, the next five to ten minutes, I'm going to say four or five things that are tied together most of this you've heard before if you've been around New Covenant a long time. I've never put it all together like I'm getting ready to do. And some of this is going to be new stuff. But I'm going to say something to you. If I, if I were to die today and I had five minutes to say something to you that I hoped you would remember the rest of your life, this is those five minutes. Th these are the truths that have shaped me. These are the truths that have changed my life. These are the truths that caused me to react to people differently than I used to. These are the truths that make me less judgmental, more forgiving, more kind, more understanding, more empathetic than I used to be. Because I'm a type A linear black and white kind of person but these truths over the last five years have shaped my life and made me who I have been. So I'm going to, for five to ten minutes, if you'll give me this, uh, these are the truths I wish I could impart to every person that knows me. All right, here we go. Number one is being you and being loved. Being you and being loved. And that's made up of four parts, okay? Being you and being loved. The first is having the guts to do away with your persona. At, at some point in my life, I read a book that says basically 50% of the people in the world are programmed to not like you, not care about you, not like what you stand for. The problem is, is that we're always fishing to win that 50% over. We're always trying to get that 50% to love us. And when we do that, we put on a, a fake persona to try to win them over, therefore losing the 50% that already like us for who we are. And so what, what I find is, is that people will make comments like, if the, you really knew who I was, you wouldn't like me. True enough, that might be, but somebody else would like you. And I'd rather have people like the real me than like the persona that I project to people. You know, it's amazing to me. The one thing I get complimented about is my transparency, my, my ability to share mistakes or, or, or weird things about myself. And, and I've, in the last five years, I am more me than I've ever been before because I don't want to impress you. I, I, I would rather be me. I, I'm much more excited about being the true, transparent Nick Horner camp, and you like me or not like me, than all the energy it takes to pro project a persona of who I think you'll like. Because here's the real issue, and most people don't stop and pause long enough to think about it. When you project a persona of who you are and somebody likes the persona, it never hits your heart because you know that's not you. 
you know that's not you. You know it's a fake made up thing you did that you gave somebody hoping that they would like it. So even if they love it, even if they like it, even if they praise it, it never hits home because you know it's not you. The best thing we could do is have the guts to get rid of our persona, put projecting things that are not ourselves, and just be real and be ourselves. And it'd be amazing how many people might leave your world, but how many people will come into your world and celebrate you. So the first thing is getting rid of that persona. The second thing is, is this concept, uh, and it's, this is, this is it's the greatest truth that's ever wrecked my life. The greatest truth has ever wrecked my life. I was in Greece three years ago, and I was speaking to a bunch of leaders. I was actually in Egypt at the time teaching leaders. And I remember that during that time, we were praying about giving all the money away that the church had. And, and if it was God, it's not just what to do, but how to do it. And I was praying about how to do it. And I remember that I was teaching these Egyptian students, and I said, God loves us all equally but I'm his favorite. I just, I said that as just a, a fun, pithy thing. And one of the women that was uh, in that group said to me, Gail Stath, she's a, a missionary to, in Greece, but, but she had invited me down to Egypt. And she said to me, do you really believe that, that God loves us all equally? I said, absolutely. I, I, there's no other option that I can think of. God loves us equally. And she says, I don't believe that. I believe God loves us all uniquely. Wow. I, I, I did not know what to do with that. That was one of those truths I could not accept immediately that just what I had to lodge in my head. I just had to process it for a while. And I remember that I was, I was walking down a street. In, after I was in Egypt, I went back to Greece for a week. I was walking down the street there, and, um, and I was reading the passage about how Jesus fed the 5,000. And he said he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to disciples to give to the people. The people all ate until they were full. And then they took up the extra. And in that moment, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's how you're to give away the money. I want you to take the money, bless it, break it into different denominations or into different packets. I want you to train the disciples on how to give it away. And I want you to give the money to the people and let the people go give it wherever they want to give it. And that's what we ended up doing. But as I was studying that passage, as the Lord gave me that strategy, I recognized the phrase that said they all ate until they were full. Now, we all eat different amount of food to get full. If I was sitting in a room with 10 other people and we all had a buffet, we would all come back with different sized plates of food and we would all eat a different amount until we became full. There, and when I saw it in scripture, it verified what Gail had said, that God loves every person uniquely. And as we expand our ability to acknowledge, to be aware, to receive, to revel in his love, he, he pours it out on us. He has an unlimited amount of love he wants to give to us, but each of us have limiting caps on what we can see as God loves, what we recognize as his love, how much we can accept of his love, how much we can delight and enjoy in his love. And so I'm on a journey right now to get rid of my persona, be authentically me, like me or not, let me throw off all restraints and restrictions that would try to keep out God's love and let God love me uniquely until I am full to overflowing so that I can be God's love to other people. Which brings up point number three. And point number three is to call the circle of love. So God is love. It's not what he does. It's who he is, right? And so he tells us a great commandment. In fact, I've really been chewing on this concept lately that making things very simple, that there is a, God's great commandment and there's God's great commission. Those two things are the two things I want to anchor my life around. God's great commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the great commission is to go and make disciples of all nations. So those two things are things I'm really trying to anchor my life on right now. Now, the first one, the great commandment, is love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. I mean, there's a phrase I use, bringing all of me in front of all of them. There are some Christians that have a relationship with the Lord around the good pieces. Uh, they don't want to admit to the sin, the shame. They don't want to bring the yucky stuff in. They, 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 they just want to live in the grace of God, and they want to, God, you saved me. You're my father. You are accept me, and they just want to bring the good stuff in. Most Christians, though, focus on the bad stuff. 
When they come to sit down in prayer with the Lord, the first thing they do is reach back and grab back every sin they committed this week and bring it in and lay it before the Lord. They have a sin-based relationship with God. That sin is the first conversation that we have to have with the Lord. And I want to say to you that as I've grown and matured, especially since I started praying and becoming very intimate with the Lord, he's comfortable, they are comfortable with me bringing all of me in front of all of them. That I can be Nick, the obedient son, Nick, the the person who sinned this week, Nick, who's immature in some areas, Nick, who's got some problems with people and struggling with forgiveness or whatever. I, I, I found I don't have to project a persona in front of them. I get to bring all of me to all of them. Now, I'm supposed to love God with all that I am. I'm supposed to love my neighbor and I'm supposed to love me. I tell people sometimes, this is one of my favorite things to do, is when somebody's talking to me about themselves and they're beating themselves up, I love to let them finish their sentence and stop them and say, you would never let anybody else talk to you the way you talk to yourself. You would never do that. The Bible, God tells us we're to love ourselves. We're to love the quirky, weird, peculiar, freaky way we are created and made. We, we, there's no, never been a creation like me on the whole planet, and, and he wants me to love that. Now, where does that love come from? Well, that love comes from the source of all love. So there's this thing called the circle of love. Do you love God first? Do you love your neighbor first? Or do you love yourself first? And the answer is none of those. The, the answer is in loving God and loving yourself and loving others, loving God, loving yourself, loving others, there's no beginning in that circle. The beginning of that love comes outside the circle from God to us. It, it is when God loved us, he infused his supernatural love to us, which then gives us the ability to love him back, love ourselves, love our neighbor. So th- this thought of being loved uniquely by God, that he wants to love us till we're full, is, it's one of the concepts that's changed my life forever, that, that, that I cannot love my neighbor with godly love without God giving me the love for that neighbor. I can't love myself unless I see myself through God's eyes. And I cannot give back to God love unless he gives it to me first. So, so he infuses into my circle this agape love, this supernatural, sacrificial love, and then I can love him, love myself, and love others back. And that brings me to the fourth part. And I wish I'd, okay, being beloved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to capture this, but I'm going to go back a couple slides. I wish I'd have put that passage here. Hold on. Look right here. So being beloved. So we, we're, we're, as we talk about uh, get a, do away with the persona and be authentically you. Then let the Lord love you uniquely, top you off. Then as you receive his love from outside the circle, give that love, not some fleshly love, but agape love, supernatural love, out to other people from the overflow of what you're getting from Papa. And then the last piece of this is being the beloved. I'm going to show you this. This is so cool. So John is writing this letter to Gaius, and he calls, he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius. He calls him beloved. Hey, beloved Gaius, hey, beloved Gaius. He doesn't even address Gaius and then throw in a sentence afterwards. He starts and the foundation of their relationship is he calls him beloved. Hey, beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you will prosper and do well even as your soul prospers. Now, that's beautiful. I mean, that's beautiful. John is writing to Gaius, and he calls him beloved. He sets the foundation of their relationship. Then he tells him he loves him in truth, and then he calls him beloved again. Now, what's amazing about this is it's being written by John, the beloved. See, it was the fact that John experienced being the beloved of Jesus, that it's so marinated in his heart and spirit 
that his relationships were formed around that beloved. He could speak the beloved over somebody. He could call out the beloved in somebody. Because he was the beloved, he saw the beloved in everybody else. So here's the thing. When people come to me with a bunch of junk, they come with, with complaints and they come with criticism, they come with negativity and fear, it's because they don't know they're the beloved. They've not experienced the beloved love of God. It is, it is the people that have experienced his beloved nature that then are capable of placing it on somebody else or calling it out of somebody else and establishing that relationship of Gaius, your beloved. Yeah. Gaius, before we talk about anything else, before I say anything else to you, your beloved, and I love you, and your beloved. And that came out of John's heart because he'd experienced from Jesus. Yes, there is a, there's a, a, the thing that's been rolling around in my head this week is the economy of God. Come on. Once God introduces something into the economy of your life, it's not just for you to receive it. It's for you to give it away. Yeah. That's, that, that's yeah. the piece right there that I think that, that, that the reason we self-care, and I'll be honest with you, nobody taught me self-care. One of the greatest deficits of my entire life yeah. is the lack of self-care. Yeah. In this season, I literally have grieved and mourned because I did not understand self-care. Never has anyone said, you've done enough, sit down and take care of you. Never has anyone said, it's okay, you need to go take a week and just go and rest. Or, hey, hey, what's driving you? Whatever's driving you is not from the Lord. Put that aside. That performance, that's, that's not what the Lord wants out of you. He wants sweetness and time and delight and desire. I just, I, because I'm good at producing, uh, people receive that producing. But I, 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 until this season, I was totally unaware of the need for self-care. And, and I'm feeling it. I'm grieving and mourning that. But, but I want to say to you that, that, that it all, you really don't have a message to share about God if it's not a message that's been sent from God. So, so, so it, 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 even if it's in the Bible, if you can't love them in the truth, it's not a truth if it doesn't come with love. Okay, so, so we've got too many Christians that are more interested in conveying a truth than they are receiving the beloved and giving the beloved away and establishing a relationship in the beloved that any truth can, can, can cross over. And so in this season, if I, the last five, ten minutes, if I, if I was to die today, the, the, the message I would want you to hear is I'd want you to hear that you don't have to be a persona. God made you the way he made you. Be you. Let him love you uniquely. You really don't have love for other humans until you receive agape love. That word beloved is agape tos. It, it's, a, it's a derivative of agape. Yeah. So he's saying to him, hey, eternal perfect love person. So it's receiving from outside the circle of love, God's love, and then, uh, and then that becoming the economy of our lives. That's, the, that's what we function from is that love. And then realizing that we are the beloved. And the more you feel and experience God's love, the more you can give that to other people. That's right. Amen. In fact, this is scandalous. I'll say it a different way. The less amount of beloved love you've received from him is the economy you're operating in. And that's the, only, that's the amount of love you have to give to other people. If you can't find your beloved in God, you're not being beloved to your spouse, beloved to your kids, beloved to your neighbors. That's why love trumps truth. Love is the basis of, of our religion, of our theology, of our belief about God. God is love. That's right. Because God is love, it's, our, it's imperative that we receive his love and then we operate from that love in that economy. All right. So now let me throw, go through a couple other slides, get back to point number two. Point number two is keeping a healthy heart. Keeping a healthy heart. And... You know, I told you within the last year that the Lord had dealt with me about that I had always led from my head, but in this season, he wants to teach me how to lead from my heart. And so um, we've, it's imperative that we keep a healthy heart. And I want to show you two verses in Psalm 37. Uh, verse 3 it says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land 
and befriend faithfulness. Now, all of that right there has to do with mental health. It's about doing good, dwelling in the land, and being faithful. It's, it's all mental. It's what we talked about last week. Here's emotional health. Next verse. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay? So what I want to talk about in this passage, sorry, what I want to talk about in this passage is that that word suke, it means the breath and the essence of life. It, it's the, your heart is the seat of emotions. It's the seat of our passions and desires. And um, we, we, we've got to take care of our heart because our heart is where love operates. Uh, truth operates here. Love operates here. And so what happens is, is sometimes our hearts get wounded. And if our hearts get wounded, you have to take a, a specific steps for that to get healed. The problem is one part of your heart can get wounded and then all the export of your heart will be wounded too. Right. It doesn't just stay in one area and it doesn't just stay with one person. If you have a picture of a person right now that you don't like, that you don't respect, that you maybe they hurt you, harmed you, maybe you, you can't forgive them right now, whatever that picture is, whoever that person is, it doesn't just stay there. Until it's resolved, any other person that looks like them, acts like them, says something like them, will automatically get a bad response from your heart because your heart is still wounded. Uh, also, and, and, and I don't want to be stereotypical to our guys, but our, our females tend to uh, be able to process emotional stuff better than most men do. In fact, some women say, my, my husband just doesn't know how to share his emotions. He just doesn't know how to share his feelings. I was on a pastor's Zoom recently, and, and several of the male pastors spoke out and said, my wife says I'm emotionally unhealthy. I can't share my feelings. I can't share my emotions. So a lot of times what happens with men is we get clogged up. We get stuck. We get stuck somewhere, and, and it takes uh, – we'll be in a situation today, and we'll respond as if it was 10 years ago because we're still stuck back there. We haven't processed it. We haven't dealt with it. In fact, in the hierarchy of creating in intimacy, um, one of the higher parts of, of creating intimacy is the first foundation is cliches. Uh, uh, wow, it's raining cats and dogs out there. Sure is a pretty day today. That, that's the basic level of communication and of intimacy. The next is when we begin to share our thoughts and opinions. And our thoughts and opinions. We begin to tell who we're going to vote for, what we think about the pandemic and stuff like that. The next level is where we begin to share our feelings and our emotions. Heart trumps head every time. We were creating with that hierarchy as human beings because God always leads from his heart. He, he is scandalous in his love. He is overwhelming in his mercy and his goodness. His thoughts towards me are good thoughts, not bad thoughts. And um, I firmly believe the enemy has no power at all in my life except what I give him. Uh, God has hemmed me in and covered me over and blessed me thoroughly and he loves me. So part of, uh, of being a Christian is being able to function from a healthy heart. If God is love, then relationship is the operating system of the kingdom, and it's impossible to have relationship without heart, Amen. any meaningful relationship without the heart. And, and, and I find that many pastors preach to the spirit of a man, but not the soul of a man. How, how do you keep a, a clean heart? How, how, do, how are you able to manage forgiveness? How are you able to heal so that the conversation can be about someone else, not about what just triggered inside of you. And so what happens is, 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 as I said before, I don't care how much scripture you've memorized or how much you tithe or how long you've gone to church. If someone accidentally pokes you and the devil comes out, you're not leading people to Jesus. I think God is more interested in our hearts for other people than he is the head that we have for other people. So in, in, as the first point is being the beloved. It's being you and being loved. It's, 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 that's what this walk is about in this season. Can we, can we dive down a little deeper into the love of God and be ourselves and be loved? And then from being that overflow of love, can we maintain our hearts? You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How, how, do, we, how do we stop and say, that hurt? Wow, that hurt. I need, to, I need to feel that. I was on a phone call with my pastor yesterday, and he asked me how I was doing with the loss of my mother-in-law and the loss of my trainer uh, at the gym, Haven Payne. And I said, you know, Frank, I, I just haven't experienced much grief in my life. And so it's hard for me to put names on it. I feel, I feel sadness. 
I feel um, loss, like permanent loss. I mean, that, that permanent loss piece is, I, I feel, uh, it feels dark. It feels heavy. Um, it's like you start to do something that n normally would feel good, but then this little cloud comes and you remember that you've lost something. And so you're, you're mourning and grieving. And I've just never had adjectives or adverbs to define it. But I can, in this moment, I, I just I need to articulate how I'm feeling. And one minute I'm fine, and then this wave of grief comes back over, and you remember that you've lost something. And so I just, as he and I were processing yesterday, depression, sadness, loss, um, just I found it so helpful to name the emotions. One of the most important things in my life is I name things. I name thoughts, I name feelings, I name circumstances, especially if there's a pattern. I love to put names on things. For one, everything that has a name has to bow but That's beneath right. the name of Jesus Christ. It's when we don't name it out loud that it has power and authority in our lives. So I like to name stuff. And so I like to express those emotions. So part of a healthy heart is to periodically pull aside from every other human being and say, let's look at my heart. Are there any yucky places that I've not been looking at? Is there any people that are locked in a prison in my heart that I need to let go? Is there any people that when I think of them immediately, I have these bad emotions? Is there any situation in my life, present or previous, that when I, it comes up, immediately shame comes over me and I start to sweat or get uncomfortable? Uh, it, it, periodically, we've got to take care of our heart because our heart is where we interact with God in love, and it's where we interact with other people. Man. How can you receive love, true love, from God if your heart's damaged and wounded? And how can you give love to other people if your heart's wounded and damaged? So if your heart is stuck or if your heart is wounded, I'm imploring you right now to deal with that in this season of your life. Okay, last thing. Number three, develop healthy soul connections. Okay, this is so important. Um, you cannot fully be you without other people. It's impossible for you to discover your brilliance, your weaknesses, discover uniquely you until you live in community with other people. It's like 10 people sitting at a table, and suddenly you reach over and start eating the turnips. And somebody's like, oh, you like turnips. Most people don't like turnips. Well, that's a uniqueness about yourself. Or you share something that you enjoy or a passion that you like about something. It's impossible for you to be uniquely you outside of community. And so we have to develop healthy soul connection. We're going to receive love from God. We're going to take care of our heart by forgiving, by unpacking, by dealing with the lies of the enemy, by writing the truth on our heart of who God's made us to be. And then we're going to have the guts to introduce ourselves to community. We're going to have the guts to interact with people and start developing relationships with other people. Now, this has been something very difficult for me. Because as a pastor, I have not artificial relationships. I have self-defined or predefined relationships. Like, like because I'm the pastor of this church, when people come to this church, I don't choose for people to come to this church. I welcome everyone. They choose to come to this church. From that then, I'm expected. There's expectations on a relationship. And some of that is acceptable, and some of it uh, is illegal. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. And, and so I have to navigate. It's, it's, every relationship is different. And I have to say, is this a professional relationship, or do I have a personal relationship with this person? And, and there's nothing wrong with having a professional relationship. You have that with your doctor. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but there's, there's different layers when you're a pastor of trying to unpack those relationships and being engaged with each other. Well, see... Feelings are important. I'm talking about emotional health. And emotional health is the seat of our feelings and our passions and our desires. I found the more I delight myself in the Lord, the more his desires come up in my heart and in my life. Now I have to engage in community and relationship with my, not just thoughts and opinions, but my heart, my emotions, my passions. And that's vulnerability there. But, but, but that's where we create bonds. See, you really don't have much of a relationship with someone 
until you can bond with them. And where we bond with them is usually not just in the spiritual or the physical. It's in the sharing of our hearts, our emotions, our passions, our desires, our dreams, our delights. That's where relationships form. You, 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 ask, you ask a woman, she doesn't want to just hear data. She doesn't want to just, if you said, hey, I was busy today, and, and, and your wife says, well, what'd you do? So, well, I went to work, went to Lowe's, came home. That's not what she wants. She wants to know what circumstances happened today. She wants you to express your feelings and, and your, your thoughts and opinions about those things. She wants to walk down the aisle at Lowe's with you, seeing what you see, and she can't do that with just data. So most women are like, talk to me. Let me in your world. How did you feel about that? And so our feelings and emotions are where we bond with other people. Amen. I've said this before, though. Feelings are great followers. They're bad leaders, okay? Our feelings are not good leaders. So it's important that we have good mental health as well as good emotional health. God created us to have feelings. He created us to love the tingle of feeling in love. He, he loves for us to enjoy good food. He loves the, the camaraderie of being with your tribe. I have some prayer warriors and people that are my tribe. And when we get together, there's a knowing each other that's way beyond the physical. It's, it's, it's way beyond that. It's spiritual. It's emotional. There, I, you know, people in my world that share my passions and dreams and desires. And, and many times we don't even have to use words because our feelings are so connected. And, and these feelings allow us to form bonds with other people. God created us that way. He could have made us like robots, but he didn't. He made us to, to feel all the emotions uh, of life, and, and we're created to do that. And when we don't have a healthy heart, we're unable to give the gift of our emotions and our feelings to other people, which restricts us from having real relationships. Amen. Did you feel that? I mean, let me recap real quick. Be uniquely you and not a persona of you so that people can reflect back to you your beauty and your brilliance. Take care of your heart so it doesn't get stuck, and it's not wounded, so that all the feelings and emotions of your heart can be expressed and shared with select people in your life that you can form deep bonds, deep relationship, because it's in that that you'll find the purest joy in the world. How can we ever hope? Mm. Father, Father, I repent right now for every preacher and every believer that thought it was acceptable to preach your truth without ever doing the work of relationship. That, that, that thought it was okay to take your word and to preach at someone a hard truth that we weren't even willing to do the hard work of developing relationship with them. Forgive us for that. May we value relationship, heart, emotions, and soul like we never had before. Yeah, amen. All right, that's the word for today. I, I still don't know what I'm talking about with all the mental and emotional. I'm learning real time. I'm processing with you. I'm not talking at you. And uh, before we go, I, I, I do want to pray for us because I want to say to you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God desires relationship with you. God made you a human. He made you uniquely brilliant. He gave you a heart. And today he's pursuing you. He's chasing you down because he wants relationship with you. So I want to pray for you right now. Lord, if there's anyone listening to my voice today, I ask God that you would subdue their heart. That, Lord, that they would have the guts and courage to not value their sin or their mistakes over your love. That they would allow your love to come over them like a wave and that you would take away their sin and all that nasty debris. That you would bring their heart alive for passion and desire, for beauty and brilliance. I ask right now, God, you'd give them the courage to simply pray and ask you to come and forgive their sins to become the Lord of their lives, and that you, Jesus, would become the center of all that they are. I pray that right now in Jesus' name, amen. Before I go, I just want to just say to all of us, may we spend some time this week looking at our heart and looking at what we believe about God's love for ourselves, and then look at the relationships we have and say, what am I really transmitting? What am I really bonding with people over? And if it's not around God's pure 
sacrificial love, I would challenge you to make an adjustment because there's deeper relationships to be had when we're functioning around the agape love of God. All right, two things. Number one, uh, if you got a prayer request, make sure you go to newcovenantchurch.com, click on that connect button, give us your prayer request. We'll be praying over that today and tomorrow. And also, if you need altar ministry, if you need somebody to call and check on you, call and pray with you, process some of this, just go to newcovenantchurch.com, click on the connect button, leave us your phone number and your name, and within the next 24 hours, somebody will call you. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great day. Good to see you. I love you. Miss you. See you soon.